Well, I did catch and cook. Didn't take me long to get it either. Yeah, that's the beauty. That's the exciting thing about far northern Australia is sort of like everything's out to get you. Blackbird on a limb, both of them diving in deeper than they've been before. And who Good morning guys, welcome back to another episode. Well, we're just sitting here having a coffee and this big bloody storm <laughs> is brewing out here and it's just starting to rain, the wind's picked right up. This big storm front is about to hit us. So we've got to sort of half pack everything up, get Jordan's bedding out of the swag, zipped up, zip up the tent while we're trying to prep to go fishing. Um, so that's that's what's you know it's the beginning of the wet season. It's like the build up. So normally these big storms they look bad and they don't happen, but this one is about to happen. Have a look at that. It's about to go there. Even the bloody cattle are running away. <laughs> ah, I'm gonna be hiding my tent. <laughs> <laughs> It could be worse. <laughs> there could be no boat. Yeah. All right, everyone, we have made it down to the boat. But unfortunately, the boat is high and dry. But as Jordo said, Jordo's mister, he always thinks of the positive side of things. He said it could be worse. As we were both pulling up, we were both, I think Jordo said it, please be here. And it always plays in my mind, as you guys know, that get back to the boat after anchoring it overnight and you just imagine that something slipped and the boat's gone up river or down river and it's gone so at least it's here but um while Jordo pushes the boat in the water for us <laughs> we'll um talk about yesterday because if you didn't watch yesterday's episode it'll give you a bit of an insight into where we are we're in um this is Kerritajar country Cape York far north Queensland and we're on the west coast which is the Gulf Carpentaria right up in uh, northern Australia and we pushed into here yesterday in the Land Cruiser and got to these like big salt flats, right? And with one vehicle, it's not wise to cross these flats with the sort of weight that I'm carrying in the trailer. Uh, you don't want to cross these flats with one vehicle, right? So we, we set up a base camp, got on the quad bike and a tinny and came down looking for a spot to put the boat in the river. And we found this spot, we called it the boat ramp, it looked perfect. But as soon as we dropped the boat in and then tried to get the quad out, we were stuck and I didn't have max tracks because I lost my max tracks for the ATV uh, a couple of days ago on the road. They fell out of the trailer and I didn't even know. And um, so I, I didn't have the max tracks, which would have saved the day. That's the lesson learned. Always carry max tracks. Um, as soon as the quad went down, we then tried everything for about two hours trying to get out of there. And um, it was proper stuck and the tide was coming in. And after the, like an hour and a half, I went into a panic mode. Um, we, I didn't think I'd be able to get the Land Cruiser in there. The winch wouldn't, like we couldn't winch ourselves out. There was nothing to winch off. 
So uh, eventually with the tide coming in, the tide was about a metre and a half from the back of the quad and pushing in fast, I ran all the way back to the Land Cruiser um, and came in and tread so lightly across the flats here, which you can see right here behind me. I followed this ridge right down here to the river, went across that grass, around the back of those mangroves and, um, and got close enough to the quad to be able to winch the quad out just as the water was at the back wheels and, um, and then very quickly it all got submerged and um, an hour and a half later the quad bike would have been completely underwater. So it was a very stressful afternoon but then we shot down to the mouth. I caught bugger all and Jordo here absolutely nailed it catching a big threadfin salmon, salmon, a good barra and then a huge barra. 92 centimetres, not a metre but a, a bloody good one and we sat down there in that, that afternoon with the tide raging in and um, just had an amazing afternoon, watched the sunset, got back to camp, had dinner, chilled out. It was great. So that's the catch up. And now here we are. We haven't seen this river properly yet. This is the low tide, as you can see, bloody boat. Um, and we're gonna go explore the mouth, see what this river has on offer. Jordo, yes, not yesterday, the day before, caught a little sow, a little wild pig, female wild pig. And um, he's, he's um, knocked the rear legs off it and we've got one of those for lunch today. So hopefully at the mouth, we're gonna get a good fire going, like a really good fire, get some good, good hot coals. And we're gonna do like a version of a cup Murray. Like it's not really a... Not really, it's just cooking it. But we're gonna cook it in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna cook it in the ground, hopefully. So anyway, let's get down the mouth. We'll do some pushing here and get down to the mouth. Just to keep you all happy, we've just done the unthinkable and put a crab pot in right here at this little drain. Little drain's still running out, so hopefully we'll see. We'll come back a bit later when that water starts coming up and the crabs are going to push back up into this creek, hopefully. That's my theory. And um, we might get a crab for afternoon tea. As always, Jordo's got a rod in his hand already. <laughs> you know it. Tiny little channel. Yeah. So this is where it all happened yesterday. Right here is where Jordo got the big barra. Right here in the mouth. It looked very different. It was a high tide. This is a super low tide. We pushed up into this little drain yesterday afternoon and had a look. But mate, I'm pretty keen to, I don't know, maybe we shoot out, check the channel and then maybe go on foot and yeah. look at this drain. Walk up in there. Yeah. Take a spear and a rod. I want to say that it circles around yeah. and comes back out over here, I think. I think that does, that drain. Yeah. Yeah, right. Oh, it's an epic river mouth. I love this. New river mouth, man. This is what it's all about. It's where it's at. Change of plans. We're going to fish this drain mouth <laughs> just here. <laughs> Jordo's just hooked up to some. Oh, you lost it. lost it. You lost it. Can't get them all. So yeah, it's closed barramundi season for me. Um, it's November, west coast, actually and the east coast right now is closed. Uh, I'm actually chasing threadfin salmon, but unfortunately they take the same lure as a barramundi, the exact same place as a barramundi, so I'm gonna hook a couple. Um, but yeah, I just gotta get them straight back in the water. And if I keep catching them, I'll stop fishing or I'll move on. Jordan, on the other hand, traditional owner of this country here, he can hunt for them all, all year round. So normally if you're not blessed to country, I've said this before, you just don't seem to catch fish. And um, I think Jordan's refusing to bless me in the country, so he just keeps catching up the fish. <laughs> no, but I've, I mean, I've been welcome to country here before, um, to this country that we're in, further down, but it's, you know, it's Kurdajar country, so I should be all right, eh? Yeah. It's just bad, bad luck at the moment. It's got <laughs> yeah, nothing. Just, just bad luck at the moment. Just bad fishing. <laughs> Uh, 
I'm going to see if we can find a mud crab or something. This is what it's all about right here, guys. Exploring these new river mouths. Just seeing what you come up with for lunch. That storm buggered off pretty quick. That's what I mean about the build-up. You get these wild-looking storms come through, but then they just disappear just as quick as they came in. Great, buddy. Yeah, mud shell up in there. It's looking a bit shallow, shallow the way. I wonder what that other bit of water was that was running over here. Let's walk that way. Another creek. Might as well have a look and then we'll just walk around this mangrovey section. Let's go make a camp under the trees up here, find some shade, find some firewood, get a big fire going, get some coals, and then we can start cooking lunch a bit later. <clears throat> it's a shame it's so bloody windy here. I'm just gonna wait for this tide to change, I think, and we'll fish that tide change. This is us. I mean, look at the ocean, it looks bloody terrible. Low tide, heaps and heaps of wind. So I don't think Today at least, we're not going to be able to hug the coast and shoot up to the next creek. It's just lousy out there for a tinny. But we're going to have fun either way. Hell yeah. We'll get a good fire going here in the shade. And cook up this, um, cook up this bit of pork. This spot hey? to set up a camp right Yeah, really nice breeze. Good view of the river. Keep going. Burn, baby, burn. Keep going. Come on, Good's having a fire. Ooh. Love it. Plenty of firewood. Let's get it cranking. So it's been it's been nearly a week now since we well since I lost my good friend Viv um, and the community Kawanyama community lost such an amazing man. Um, I've had a lot of time to think about it. I can say Viv's name now because I'm out of out of that country. Um, 
so for cultural reasons, yeah, anyway, I can say his name and I've had a lot of time to reflect on it and one thing I picked up the other morning, I was sitting having my, my cup of coffee and if you've been, well, if you've been watching the show, uh, season seven, from the beginning, you'll see that I've been really following the story of this young boy named Umglo. Um, he was 14 years old and he was a castaway on the east coast of Cape York. Um, the Utalungul clan, or the Utalungul tribe and the Night Island people, uh, Night Island clan, took him in. And that was in the 1850s, 1840, 1850s, before uh, Aboriginal people had ever seen white man in Cape York, or especially over there. So. I, th I found that story. They, he lived with them for 17 years, and he he learnt he had to learn their ways. Like he, he learnt their language, he learnt all their customs. He was initiated as a Night Island man. Um, he had three wives, two children. Amazing stuff. Went to war with neighbouring um, clans and neighbouring tribes, and killed men and had scars on his arm to to show all the kills. Just amazing stuff. And I really just couldn't get enough of this story right so I took all of you along for the ride and we went to the exact beach in front of the exact island where he lived and where the Night Island people lived and it was almost like I could feel their presence it was such an amazing journey um, and I do hope you guys enjoyed that but it's like I couldn't get deep enough you know I wanted to meet his descendants because he did have children um, I was just so overwhelmed with this story and the other morning I was sitting there having my cup of coffee and I thought it just clicked that that basically I've spent the last 18 months knowing a man who had a very similar story and it, and it never really occurred to me so a bit of a bit of a background on Viv was he he moved to Kawanyama in the 70s when he was like 17 years old or something and he 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 moved back and forth a couple of times but he basically lived in, in Kawanyama the rest of his life, okay, until his dying days, which was last week, um, as a 70 odd year old man. And when he first came up, he was welcomed by, I think it was the Kokum and Jenna tribe. And they, the old men, these are the true old men who, who came out of the bush, you know, like um, men by law, initiated men. They came out of the bush into the, um, into the Mitchell River Mission at the time. And that's where they met Viv and they took him in because he was so passionate about their culture and about learning and the way they lived and they'd walk for you know hours on end days on end and he knew that country like the back of his hand the country where he was found by his grandson was his country and he knew it like the back of his hand because he'd been walking it for 50 years with the old men um, now what i didn't realize until now was viv was actually initiated um, as a man by law and he had scars on his chest to show it and um, this was done by by the old tribal men and um, so Viv's story was that he came in was accepted by the by the local tribe um, he became one of them and he did a lot for that tribe and a lot for the surrounding tribes and here's me I've spent countless hours with Viv just sitting drinking tea listening to his stories learning about Aboriginal culture and about his life and um, and I never put two and two together until the other morning drinking my coffee that I was following so closely to this story of Umglo when Viv, my friend, lived a very similar story. You know, he might have been 110 odd years later, but, um, or 120 years later in a slightly more modern time, but still very similar. And he was there by choice, whereas the other boy, you know, eventually he was there by choice, but he was first there, he was a castaway, he was a ship, he was a shipwrecked and he was stuck there, so. So that's Viv's story, an amazing man, a true friend of mine, someone that inspired me, someone that I looked up to as a, like a mentor, um, and someone that just went far too soon. You know, he still had so much more to share with the world and his legacy, I'm hoping we can all carry on and finish this um, museum, all these artifacts, everything that he put his life's work into. I want to get finished for Viv because he deserved that. So I miss you, mate. Um, I wish we could have had one more cup of tea together, but I am glad that I met you, had the time with you, and particularly that I had that last cup of tea with you before you went and um, spent those few hours with you talking. and.
Alrighty guys, the fire is looking perfect for cooking right now. Um, you can see we've got so, so much coals going on. Now the plan was we dug a hole and we were going to load that up with coals and then put the, put the pork leg in, which is just here on the ground and uh, wrap it in foil, put it in there and then cover it with more coals. But because I've already got a hole going on here, I think I'll just take these big sticks off. Um, this because it's going to be really hot in the earth here as well. Scrape back some of the coals, place it there, cover it back up with coals and then cover it with sand. All right, so the fire's looking perfect. Now what we're going to do here, um, I've brought an onion with us. We got the big pork leg there. <laughs> it's a lot of meat for me and Jordo. Um, and wrap it in alfoil and put some of this rub on there. So I got this from Normanton Butcher, uh, all-purpose seasoning rub for fish, veggies, everything. Yeah, it's got salt, sugar, spices, uh, dehydrated vegetables, all that kind of stuff. So I shouldn't need salt. Um, so we'll load that up. I've got a little bit of rice there in the jar and a um, jet boil there so I can make a cup of tea and we're just gonna kick back might even chuck it in there because I'm going to leave this for like an hour and a half, I reckon, and get the boat back in the water and go for a squirt up the river. Now, Jordo is going to do this, but he's still down there fishing, so looks like I'm cooking lunch. There we go. I want to cover this thing. All right, I've got some onions here. Chuck those onions in. Now the idea is you want to slow cook this, all right? So I don't know what the temperature is going to be in there, but once we cover it up with sand, it'll lose its temperature a little bit. And um, you know, that really hot, it's going to go from like 200 degrees, say, uh, it'll drop quite quick down to like 100 or even lower, but it should just stabilize at that with the sand on top. Be like a little, little oven. All right, now when you're cooking like this, I've done this before once and it kind of put me off. I, we cooked a whole pig once, me and Dane actually, Dane from, couple of seasons back um, we used to do a lot of missions before we started filming well before I started filming and this was on the Cape but way further up in a river on the west coast and we killed a little um, little boar cooked it up in like a cup Murray the first time we'd ever done one and it wasn't that great we didn't have any salt pepper spices oil nothing and um, it wasn't that great it kind of put me off but so you really get one shot at getting this right okay so um, you can't it's not like you can take it out and should, like open the oven door, check it, make sure it's ready, close the oven door. Once it's wrapped up like this and it's in the coals, that's it, that's your one shot. So I wanna get it right and being a wild caught pig, I wanna make sure it's cooked properly, all right? If anything, overcook it rather than undercook it, um, being pork, and, um, but I wanna do a really slow, hot cook. Uh, you know, not hot, but sorry, really slow and low heat cook. So that's the plan, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna dig a hole in these coals and get it cracking. That bastard. That's hot. <laughs> mm. Really seem to have died off there, isn't it? The fish? Mm. It's too hot, eh? So the idea is you want to seal all the smoke, everything in there, hey? Yeah. No air can get in or out. You don't want to see any little... Chuck it on top. So Jordo brought a packet of chips for four days camping and um, just found ants in them. He's got to share his only bit of tucker with the ants. Just pick a random one, right? <laughs> we now have a second channel called Trucks, Tinnies and Trebles. Um, if you want to jump over to that and subscribe, that would be fantastic. Trucks, Tinnies and Trebles is where I review and tell you guys about all the products that I use. Uh, from backpacks to filleting knives to 
you know, survival knives to the hats to jet boils, um, everything that makes like tinnies, lures, fishing rods, everything on my truck, suspension, airbags, canopies, fridges, all that stuff. Um, everything that makes my life easier out here on the road, up here in Cape York in far northern Australia, um, gear that I've tried and tested. There's gonna be a lot of stuff that I try, test and don't like, and I'll tell you about that too. Um, super honest channel, jump over there, check us out, give us a subscribe while we're growing, I would really appreciate it. We found a good little spot here. Good sticks, kind of out of the wind. Gonna flick a, f a flick a few lures here anyway, and then we're gonna get some lures. <laughs> do a tongue twister, and then we're gonna get up. And there's a bit of a rock bar we want to check out, but we don't have too much time before um, our our pork is ready. Don't rough me. on. Where is he? Behind the boat. Oh, it's a big barra. It's a barra. Yeah, really? Know. I won't be able to get him up. Oh shit, it's so yellow. It's a pretty one. I'll bring him up just here. Oh, oh. Just going Don't do it, bud. Don't do it. Oh! Ah! You bastard. <laughs> that was a good one. Oh, and you guys didn't even get to see it. It was so pretty. It was. So yellow. Sorry guys, shitty film work there by Nath. One job. Oh, I got another one. Ah, oh, Barra. Barra looking at my door. <laughs> it was just over there, right on that point. Oh, there you can see it. Oh yeah, doing that thing again. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Don't know where to look. Look at the stingray over here, guys. Boom. Now you remember we, this was like two trips or three trips back, we filmed this with a drone, it was the first time I ever saw it, the stingrays leaping up onto the bank and getting a feed. And now every trip since I see this happening. Christ, calm down. Jordo's got a wild little barramundi here. He's got a bit of fight in him. And that's a little boy. So barramundi, when they reach about the 80 centimetre size, they um, change sex, change gender into a female. So Jordo's got a little boy here. Fella. On the pink oh, nice. Atomic Slim Twitcher. It's been going good this trip, eh? Hey? Uh, hey. Now that wasn't as big as the one he just dropped. Yeah, it wasn't. Don't remind me of that. <laughs> right, Jordo. Yeah. Before you pick a lure, yeah. I have a challenge for you. Yeah. Our Patreon community set a challenge for me to catch a barramundi on a cod lure, on a Murray cod lure. And actually sent me a box of Murray Cod lures. That's not one. You can't use that one. Challenge accepted. And, and you can't use that one. You can't use that one because they're barrel lures. I put them in there. But since that, since I can't chase barramundi this trip, I think the challenge lands on your shoulders. Okay. We'll get one. We'll get one. On <laughs> that, yeah, I reckon you get one on that. <laughs> you get one on that. I think they more meant like a spinnerbait. But <laughs> let's start with that one, eh? Spinnerbait. Nah, do whatever. Whatever you think. Alright, let's try this one first. Okay. Oh, right. I know, I'm liking the look of this gold one. Right yeah, that's one. Oh, yeah, let's go this. So this is the box of lures, guys, that the Patreon community sent, except for that guy, that guy, that guy, and that guy. Cod lures, eh? And that guy. Everything else is a cod lure. Murray cod. So Murray cod, if you don't know, if you're not a fisherman, they're found, they're, you know, down the Murray River down south, everywhere, like a lot of other places as well, but the Murray River is where they're from. The Murray Cod, the Mighty Murray, and the, the following behind the Murray Cod is as big as Barramundi. You know, it's like, it's a huge, um, it, it's, it's got a really big following. Um, so, going on here. up here in Barra country, I reckon you'd be able to do it, hey? I reckon you might get one first cast. That's what I think. Shout out to Dirty for sending the box of lures. And I think it was Craig who put in the, um, the suggestion, Craig who put in the suggestion for the uh, catching a barrel on a cod lure. Oh, you get a fish, not the same, so. Yeah. 
that time. He's raging in here. I think we should go. Oh, oh where'd he go? Oh, I lost it. No, I didn't. I'm on. I'm on. He's just swimming towards us. Could be a thready. It's a thready. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. Woo! Oh, look at this. We got the, we got the bloody pliers. Oh, they're not in there, are they? No. <laughs> <laughs> the pliers pouch. The pliers pouch. He's going to get silly because he was still green. All right, this guy here is a threadfin salmon or a king salmon. And um, if you're going to keep one for a feed, you want a big one because the fillets, they're quite skinny, as you can see, big long tail. But they hit really hard and fast and they're chasing jelly prawns in here. This is what we thought was in here. This and barramundi. And um, when they do hit, sometimes they go straight for the boat like that. I thought I actually lost him, but he was just swimming hard and fast for the boat. Amazing fish. Let him go. Luckily, we got pork for lunch. Yeah, lucky. I'll take that pink one. Straight back on. Ah, he's given up already. <laughs> nah. Todd Lewis is shit. <laughs> Strange. Gonna hit one fish. Right, we're back. I reckon it's been two to two and a half hours. We're both absolutely buggered. You just start to lose your energy. It's interesting, hey, like it's back, back where I live, where, you know, normal life, you don't push yourself to these limits. So it's nice to do this and feel your energy, just you lose your energy and then the energy to come back when you have a feed. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> Some heat. Yeah. Yeah, there's heaps of heat in there. Punch, yeah, that's it, eh? Well, so the key here, like Jordo said, is not to puncture that alfoil and get all the sand and ash into the meat. That's going to be pretty hard not to do. How, do, how far down is it? Oh yeah, go under it with a couple of big sticks. Oh! <laughs> and don't do that either. <laughs> I can see alfoil though. I think you've gone through the edge of it. Oh no! It was kind of like, like that, hey. Yeah, you got it. find some she oak to lay that on. Yeah, it's just that bit, it's got sandy. Bit of cold. Oh, it's a bit in there, eh? Oh, maybe that made it in. Oh man, I ain't fussy. No, I'm not fussy either. I might do have a couple of forks. Oh, mate, it smells so good. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, there's a young sour well, so the meat should be tender, like tender. What a feed. Have a taste. Have a taste. Um, I don't even care that it's got sand on it. Yeah, it looks really soft and tender. Mmm. Yeah? That's so good. I'm gonna attack the underside of this one. Oh, man. Holy hell. How good. It's so soft. Yeah, man. You don't even need a knife. Yeah. Well done, Jordo. Well, yeah. Wild pig, catch and cook. Didn't take me long to get it either. I just accidentally walked up on it when I was fishing in the mangroves. Yeah. And then I was, was there like, a whole mob of them? No, just the one. I saw it running off over the flats and I was about 
40 metres away from my bike. I started legging it back, jumped on, and then <laughs> chased it through the bush for like 10 minutes, and then yeah, grabbed him by the tail. I had mm. that one rope I told you about. Zip tied its front legs. <laughs> if only you had a camera. Yeah. What a treat. This is so different to our normal catching cooks. <laughs> Look at this. Just a little bit of sauce would be nice, like a drizzle of know, sriracha or mm, plum sauce. Plum sauce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the shade's moving on me. I've got to find some more shade. I just woke up, had a little kip <laughs> after that feed. Look at this bit of shade here. Jordo's just gone down for another swim. Uh, the heat of the day up here, you just gotta like, you know, the fishing stops anyway. This time of year, in the, um, the build up, it's so hot up here. So everything kind of slows down, like you guys normally see us. You know, we fish hard all day, or we're chasing mud crabs or doing something. But, um, you know, it's November, it's mid November, it's really hot, everything slows down anyway. So, I think you just got to take this time to have a feed, recoup some energy, <coughs> and plan the afternoon. And it's just a shame about this wind, you know, it really makes it hard. I was hoping to explore the coastline with a boat, but we're just not going to be able to do that. So, we'll have to do it with a quad bike. Um, I'm thinking we're going to pull the boat out tonight on the high tide with the quad and then um, and then push up the coast with the quad bike tomorrow in the next episode. So stick around for that. But yeah, just sitting here now under these she-oak trees, <clears throat> I was chatting with Jordo. Um, so this country we're on here now is Keritaja and the next tribe up, I'm pretty sure is Kunjin. Now Kunjin, as you guys know, Kunjin, Kokobera and Kokomanjana are in Kawanyama now. That's where everyone lives. But back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, this is going back, you know, it could be thousands of years, Jordo was saying this spot right here at this river mouth, under these she-oaks, <coughs> was a meeting area for the two tribes. So um, Kunjin and Kuritaja would get together here, I don't know how often, but they'd get together and they'd, they'd have ceremony um, and they would trade and I suppose they'd discuss important topics like marriage arrangements and things like that and this would be the place so it's pretty cool to be laying here with Jordo ah, something just bit me laying here with Jordo under the same she oaks you know like they're probably different but there would have been she oaks here always um, and just you know trying to trying to take all that in you guys know I love doing that just imagining but the, yeah so why we we're chatting was because there's no fresh water here but they must have known you know they Kunjin people would, would walk a long way to get to here and the Kiritaja so you know it's not like they had water tanks or or like water bladders or anything back then all they had was a coolman to carry their water which aren't real big so if they're going to come and camp here they must have been fresh water they must have known where it was, some kind of spring that they dig up. Which is so cool. I'd love to know where these where these springs are. The knowledge of, of the country they walked back in those days was just phenomenal. Nothing. My. We're sitting here. Just stay in the boat, mate. <laughs> All right, we're gonna have one last session this afternoon. We're back at the river mouth. 
hopefully we can get a couple of big fish or at least one fish for dinner. We want to go back and cook fish on the coals for dinner and check our crab pot on the way back as well. I'm going to fish big spin rod, 30 pound braid, uh, 60 pound leader, and this guy here is a uh, atomic uh, live bait, I think it's called, or real baits, that's what it is. What is going on? Of course, it's bloody dinner time. The only food I have is frozen. The only time we can't catch anything. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, it's just dead. You know what's going on? Heaps of water moving. Perfect time of day to be fishing. I don't know. All the birds were quiet at the river mouth. That's what we noticed. Everything looked the same as yesterday, except the birds were all sitting on the sand, just chilling out. Whereas yesterday, they were going nuts feeding on bait. Nah, next spot. Yeah, we're gonna have to. Go on, two big bucks. Come on, baby. Nothing. Holy hell! We are not having any luck today! Get that stinky, bloody fish back in the river. Nothing back. Nah, nah. Is it going to pull the boat out? Yeah. Should have left the bloody pot at home. Who brings crab pots? Yeah, the crab pot. I reckon if we had to just go on walking today, we would have got a crab. Yeah, man. Sometimes they are good, I have to admit, but... <sighs> well, this, is, this is it, bro. Last, last ditch effort. Catch some dinner. Right. Yep. All right, Jordan, I got a little one. Right. Jordan's got a little bar out and he's going to keep him for dinner. Might put together some rice or something like that to go with it. You're gonna share him with me? Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, mate, I'll share. You're a good bloke. Pretty average, Dan. Yeah. All right, guys, that is a wrap for another episode. Um, like Jordan just said, a bit of an average day, but it was still amazing to be up here on such a remote river system up, up here in far northern Queensland. And, you know, to be here with Jordan in your country, mate, and, um, you can't have good days every day fishing. I still had a good day, like cooking up that, that bit of pork, oh, yeah, that, that was, leg. That was, pretty that was delicious, you know? Um, but yeah, the fishing was just really slow for some reason, and we kind of just thought, like I wasn't that worried, because I thought this afternoon was going to be really good, so, um, which now just hasn't happened, unfortunately. But stick around, because tomorrow, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna head back to camp now. That's why I'm wrapping it up, because it's where we're about to lose light. Head back to camp, or oh, back to the quad bike, and drag the tinny out of the river leave it there for the night and we'll come back in the morning and get it with a trailer and we're going to take it up to the next river system I think and fish up there for the day. So that's a wrap for another episode. Thanks for having us mate, I won't push you in. No worries mate. Um, <laughs> no crabs, no big barra. If you want to see that go back to the last episode because Jordan got a 92 this time last night. But um, yeah, we'll see you all next week. 
on the next episode. Get your merch, wildreaches.com. Make sure you subscribe, tell all your mates, share the, share the show around. Um, Patreon.com forward slash wildreaches if you want to be a part of that. And jump over to the new channel, uh, Trucks, Tinnies and Trebles, or Trucks, Trebles and Tinnies. Just type in both of them because I'm not sure which one it is yet. Um, but that's going to be reviewing all the products that we use up here in the bush. Uh, the stuff that I've tried and tested. I'll tell you if it's good or if it's bad. It'll just be an honest review. Um, so go check that out too. Alright, see you next week. Oh man. You can't win every day, hey? You can't. It is an epic river though, I really like it. Mm, I guess that's why they call it fishing and not catching. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to do this hopefully the easiest way possible. I'll start with that way and then if that doesn't work we'll try the winch and if that doesn't work we'll do a double line pull with the winch. But the easiest way is a couple of soft shackles like this, Sabre soft shackles, the big Sabre uh, utility rope, which is about two meters long, I think, from memory. This guy here. Now, and this big soft shackle, this here is wrapped in kinetic, it's got like a kinetic wrap on it. Uh, not kinetic, I'm so tired. Um, Kevlar, Kevlar, it's got a Kevlar wrap on it. So what I'm gonna do is put this into here um, put the pin back, put the pin back through here, and then um, this soft shackle will go around the utility rope like this. I'll show you in a sec. Got that Kevlar wrapped the big soft shackle to the um, Sabre utility rope, down to a soft shackle, the bow of the boat, and spread over the two handles, and that just goes straight through that soft shackle. And hopefully we can get it up over this ridge here. We're laughing, eh? Oven. Get your crocs out of the way. Yeah. Hope that doesn't fall off. Put my helmet on. And that is how you get a boat out of the water, Wild Reacher style. Let's just chuck the plonk out in case there is this freak tide tonight. You never know what can happen, mate. You never know, eh? <laughs> you never know. Hey, good day, mate. How you going? All right, guys, I thought I'd show you um, the jet boil stash. Now, actually, I'll show you guys this in the... Um, and I'll compare it to my other jet boils. I've got another three jet boils. I'll compare them all in my other channel, which is the um, trucks, tinnies, and trebles. So I'll do one on that soon. But this is a little stash. It packs into something so small. Uh, it's super lightweight, and it's good for things like this. Days like today, you can make two cup of teas out of it, or you can cook a meal if you're hiking, something like that. Packs down to the smallest out of, out of all the jet boils. So I'll show you guys that in the other channel. Yeah, that's the beauty. That's the exciting thing about far northern Australia is sort of like everything's out to get you. You know, whether it's crocodiles, the tide, um, the sun, you're just so remote that you really, you can, you've only got yourself to rely on, okay? So if you're coming up here, make sure you're prepared. You have all the right gear, you have a backup for all that gear, you know, snake bite kits, all that stuff. It's that phone because if you get in trouble out here, yeah, you've only got yourself to rely on.